Kemba, 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 you tantalizing temptress in the wonderfully tight t-shirt. Kemba, baby. Hey, Kemba. Hey, me, Kemba. Radio broadcast episode 11, Now the Wind Has Changed Direction. Very excited about this episode and very grateful that we were able to put this together. I've got a very special guest and we're just going to get to him right now. Tom Robinson. <laughs> Kimba kid, Kimba Rooney, how you doing? <laughs> so, so good to see your face. Hey, the pleasure is entirely mine. I mean, I've seen my place and I know the pleasure is entirely mine seeing yours. <laughs> how you okay. doing? It's been a hot minute. Yes, it has. Uh, well, how long has it been? Uh, 30 years? I'm going to say pretty close to 30 years. Well, you look the same, you know? I mean, oh, start. You really, you really do. You and really you look the same. You sound the same. <laughs> okay. So That's when little, I would... A little bit grayer. A little, yeah, well, aren't we all? Um, you know, when I was, I, I was telling you, when I was putting together this podcast, I was originally planning on uh, on going solo and then I saw a post that you did okay on Facebook well we worked together the story is from when the the time when we worked together so I said oh I gotta get I gotta get a hold of Tom and see if he'll be part of this po- podcast because we worked together um you you were in radio long uh, probably maybe a good decade before you got I know you started oh. at Zeta in 88 okay uh, I started in radio in 70 75 75 or so so, so yeah, so I was at Data 87. You came along in 88. I was doing 6 to 10 at night, and you were hired initially doing 10 to 2, I think it was, the Nighthawk show. Uh, no, I was doing I was doing all night. Oh, uh, then, I, then I was 6 to midnight, and you were midnight to 6. Yeah, yeah. Uh, okay, all right. Yeah. Because eventually it changed where I started doing 6 to 10 at some point, and then you got bumped up to middays. Middays. Right. And, and, and we're going we're gonna to get to that story. Okay. But we were one of the things about the podcast that I was talking about is with everything that's going on right now, and I do a podcast based on my radio days. Wanted to talk about race, racism in radio, and okay. and stories that have happened surrounding that. And one of the things from back in '88, late '80s, early '90s, and even before that, no one knew what you looked like unless you. They went to an appearance. There was no smartphones, selfies, web sites. True, true. That's very true. I like it that way. Yes, this is true. So, so do I. But all they they all, all had to go by your your voice, and mm-hmm. and you, people used to. I think we used to do even as DJs. Didn't you imagine what somebody sounded like, and then you'd meet them and be like, "Oh, they didn't, they didn't <laughs> think they look like that." <laughs> Which is the reason why I I, <laughs> I had a great face for radio. Exactly. That's what we all say. Yeah. So. Um, one of the, I I had um, three. Now we both in the, we worked at Zeta, so it's a rock station, and I had three main perceptions about me that I that I'd come to find over the years when I'd meet people. Finally, uh, the third most was that I was taller. The second was blonde, which oh, I okay. yeah. <laughs> and um, the the number one perception about me back in the time before anyone saw what I looked like was that I was black. Oh really? No kidding. Okay. No kidding. Okay, because I usually get, I usually got, I was a fat white guy. <laughs> <laughs> that's serious. That's, that's why I always got, which, it, which I always thought was strange. But, but uh, the crazy part was, because as a rock format, as we were, we were talking about that too, it's predominantly a white audience. Mm-hmm. So what would, ha- what would happen was I would go to an event and people would come up to me and say, oh my God, Kimba, I thought you were black. I'm sorry. <laughs> I'm sorry. <laughs> I'm sorry. And I would say, why are you sorry? <laughs> well, I I just, you know, and then they, you know, do the backpedal thing. But I thought, okay, okay, but I that happened more than once. And it really took me aback when I'm like, okay, uh, I'm not, but if I was, wouldn't that be all right? Don't you like listening to me? <laughs> oh yeah, yeah, Ken Bobo. Okay. Now, as you, a black man in rock radio, did they acknowledge say anything to you? Uh, yeah, well, it was very strange because I have the, uh, because both my parents are mixed, okay? Uh, I, I kind of popped out weird, you know? So <laughs> so I was I found that I was always uh, usually too white for black people and too black for white people. white people. So that kind of threw me in the middle no matter what. So I was perceived as, uh, I mean, I've, I've been perceived as now albino, you know, I know, you know, no, 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 by no, you know, they, 
they have white hair and pink eyes, you know, but I've been called that many times. And, and, and it's very strange, the perception, my perception, uh, that people would have of me. So I, I actually ran the gambit of, 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 yeah. of a whole bunch of things, you know, small furry animal all the way there, you know. <laughs> <laughs> and that's, I know you said when Pete moved you to uh, middays, it was because you were warm and fuzzy. And my, I always thought of you as being very infectious. Your, your delivery, you were always sounding like you were like a kid in a candy store. Because I specifically always remember that was Juicy Brucey, <laughs> Juicy <laughs> Brucey Springsteen. Juicy Brucey Springsteen. <laughs> I, I had a way. For some odd reason, I always like naming things. You know, uh, you know Captain Jack. Even you remember. Our promo guy, Captain Jack. Yes. You know, uh, I thought Jack was just, you know, just too simple. We had to give him a, you know, uh, a, a moniker, as it were. So uh, it was Captain Jack. Yeah, uh, that was just a thing that I've always had. I still, to this day, name people, you know. Oh, time. yeah. I had the Kimba Kid and Kimba Rooney. <laughs> there you go. On the Kimba cast. On the Kimba cast. <laughs> <laughs> it's, it's, that's true. It's just, it's just a thing of mine, you know. Because uh, I actually started, when I started radio, I um, I lied through my teeth, basically. Uh, I was working at a beautiful music station in Jupiter, Florida, and just doing news. Uh, five minutes of news twice a night. <laughs> and, uh, and, and while the beautiful music was playing, I would make fake tapes like I was on the radio, like I was really on the radio. Yeah. And I'd send them out, and I'd send them out, and I'd send them out, and never got an answer. So uh, one day this guy called me from Indianapolis and said, hey, you know, uh, you want to work? And I said, sure. And uh, so they hired me for all nights in Indianapolis, a new radio station that was just coming on the air. And that was Q95. And so uh, I, I went and I'm doing all nights and I didn't know, I didn't know anything. I mean, I knew, I knew absolutely nothing. <laughs> and, you know, those little, those little numbers that on the log uh, that you're supposed to pick those commercials. I didn't know what those numbers meant, you know. <laughs> I, I didn't. I didn't know. There you so, go, trial by fire, sure. Yeah, so I would just listen to the people during the day, and uh, take a little bit of of their stick, and you know, and the plus disc jockeys I've heard, and uh, I just learned as I went. And later on, when they tried me for seven to midnight, and I beat the number one jock in town three times, um, and I'm like number one in the city of Indianapolis. I said to my boss, I said, I said, uh, you know, those were fake tapes I sent you. You know, uh, I didn't know what I was doing when you hired me. And he just looked at me with, and his eyes got really big and he just went up against the wall and said, don't say that. <laughs> said, Get out of here. Don't, say that. don't tell me that. Yeah. Don't tell yeah. Me that. And then you worked at BCN as well. Yeah. Yeah. Worked, oh, mm -hmm. God. Yeah. That was, that was a nightmare. That was because that was a station I grew up listening to. When I was a kid, you know, going to high school and stuff. That was I, a nightmare. <laughs> yeah, but it was, it was. It yeah. was. Talk about, you know, talk about having problems with police. That's the only place where I've actually gotten beaten up by the police. And uh, I got arrested. Uh, uh, it was, it was terrible. It was, it was a nightmare. As a matter of fact, there was a time when I thought they were going to have me killed. Yeah, it was, it was, a, it was probably the biggest uh Biggest mistake I ever made because I, I got two jobs at that time. I got a job in um, in Long Island at WBAB and I got a job at WBCN at the same time, which happened to me a lot. I was always getting two jobs at the same time and I had to pick one or the other. And uh, so I ended up going to BCN and that was the biggest mistake of my career. Right, is, that the, is, that, is that the club story you told me about? Uh, the club oh. story. The club story? Yeah, or is that an, or is that another time? Uh, yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> the police and I, you know, we're like we're like this. Um, yeah, that's probably another story. Oh, by the way, incident. Yes. Mm -hmm. Of um, I told people that because I gave part one on my face Facebook page. Yes. Part of me getting arrested. Yes. Uh, and what had happened was we would do a show. We would do my show live from Pizza Hut. Mm -hmm. Once a month, once a month, I'd be doing. Hey, this is Sonny Robbins live from Pizza Hut. Okay, great. And uh, I, I'd uh, I'd go and do a show. So so one day I, I'm getting ready to go on the air about 15 minutes before the show, and the police come in, and they 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 walk up to me and they say, "Is that your van?" And I said, "No, it's the radio station van." You know, yeah. 
They said, uh, what's your name? And I said, uh, it's Tom Robinson. And they said, is that your real name? I said, no, it's not my real name. Uh, my real name is Tom Semper. Why? And they said, uh, you've got the right to remain silent. <laughs> Anything you say again, and I'm going, what's going on here? What? No. And uh, yeah, that was really strange. And as, as it turned out, I was on probation. I was on probation for two years. And uh, my last payments, the person I usually dealt with was on vacation. So I was dealing with somebody new. And, um, and so I'm telling them I work at the radio station. It was my last payment. I've done two years with no problem and, and everything. So um, wh what had happened was they were saying that I didn't give my last payment. So they, they threw me in, in jail. And then when I called up uh, my boss, uh, our program director, yes, he that, fired me. <laughs> that, was that was that Peter or was that Frank? But that at was, that point, no, that was Peter. That, that was, was Peter. Okay, a great Frank story too. But anyway, uh, that was Peter. And he, <laughs> fired, he fired me, and um, which is understandable. But when I finally did get out, and I finally did get a lawyer. I spent probably more money on lawyers than anyone you know. Uh, Whitey Bolter, maybe. <laughs> 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 but uh, so so anyway, uh, what had happened was the person who took the payment took the payment under the name of Tom Robinson. So my real name, Tom Semper, did didn't pay, <laughs> and so that's the reason why I was being arrested. But my question was, seeing as how they had my address, why didn't they come to my house and arrest me? Why did they wait until I was in front of all my radio fans? The reason I remember that so well, yeah. you you being arrested, was that when you got fired, they promoted me to midday. Oh, did they really? And oh. then how how long was it before you you had to straighten it out? And so I I think I spent a week or two in middays. I don't know how long it took to get it straightened out, but then they had to come back to me and go, um, we have to, Tom's coming back. You're going back tonight. <laughs> Oh, I'm sorry. I didn't know that. No. I, I, I did not know that. No. Uh, but that's yeah, why. I, it was only about a week or so. Yeah. Just about a week. And that's why I remember it so well. Because, you know, they came into me and we had to let Tom go because of what happened. And we're going to promote you to middays. And I was like, yay. And then like a week later, it was like, you're going back tonight. Yay. <laughs> <laughs> wow. I, I see now that's something you learn something new every day. But but anyway, those, those of you who uh, read my Facebook page and wanted to hear part two, Part two is I did pay. It was a mistake on the. Um, they used your radio name instead of your actual name. They applied it to the, somebody with the same name as your radio name. Yeah. Which is the problem with having two names sometimes. Now, now the people from uh, Michigan, Grand Rapids. My name was Tom Van Dam. I love that name. <laughs> yeah. I love that name so hard. Tom uh, Van Dam. Isn't that great? That's I always awesome. used to say that uh, I was dropped as a child, so I was Van Damaged. <laughs> And then eventually, which I'll put a better picture of this up, is when the, the newsletter started coming out. Oh, that's right. That's 1990, right. and you were featured on the front with your handsome mug, and it talks all about your history and stuff. But I'll put it so everybody can see it a little bit better. So in 1990, this was something that they would mail out because it was like folded up, and then they'd send it. But before that, you really didn't know what the heck we look like. That's true. That's true. Yeah, I was doing Cheers. And again, it was right around this time we were all working together and I was doing Cheers early 90s. And uh, these these guys came up and were talking to me. They were from out of town and they chit chatted me up. And then they, they the guy says, I want to give you my card. And he gave me the card. But, you know, when some, sometimes when somebody hands you a card, you just hold on to it while you're still talking to them, which right. happened. Then they walked out and I looked at the card. I still have it because I can't. I'm just going to flash it real quick. It says you've been patronized by the KKK. No, I swear. To, and I was like. <laughs> and I, I, I have it to this day to prove that it actually happened because I was just flabbergasted by that. I'm like, what would make him think he could just walk up and hand me this? Wow. Wow. That's scary. That's scary. That's... And it's just, just, I mean, that's 30 years ago, but it's not that long ago. No, no. Well, you know, I mean, hey, you know, look, look who's in office now. <laughs> and you, but you've talked about some of the stuff that we're seeing now that you didn't even think you were going to see in in your lifetime, in our lifetime. Oh, that's that's very true. Although it it seems to, um, it seems to bring out, it seems to bring out the racist part of people. Um, this new movement, I'm seeing that a lot. Uh, and people don't know that they're being uh, racist when you know. 
at certain times when they say certain things, you know, like the Black Lives uh, Black Lives Matter movement, you know, pisses people off. I know. It has a tendency to piss a lot of people off, you know. How and, dare you? Yeah, really, really. <laughs> and um, and uh, you know, they just they just got rid of Aunt Jemima on the uh, on the pancake on the pancake thing. And I had a, a friend, a guy I went to school with, said, "We kind of like that." And I'm going, "We?" And I'm going, yeah. "You know, don't you mean you?" Because and I and I noticed that I was, a lot of people were like. There goes a, a childhood memory. I'm like, when's the last time you bought that? Let alone, like, it's like, <laughs> yes. stop. It's very strange. I don't know how this is going to eventually end up. Um, you know, but the way I look at it, it's not, I mean, I'm old now. You know, I mean, I'm old. I'm, I'm on the, you know, I'm, the, I'm going downhill now. <laughs> <laughs> but it's just very strange that uh, the way things are turning. And I don't know. When, when 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 the smoke clears, I don't know the way the world is going to be. You know what I'm saying? It, it's kind of a scary time, uh, and and I don't know if um, when when I started when I got my fir first real radio job, it was in Indianapolis. You know, and I was driving to Indianapolis, and I fell asleep behind the the wheel, and the car rolled, and I landed uh, 23 feet from a 200 foot drop into a river. So I didn't know that until we went the next day and I saw it in the sunshine and I saw the, the drop yeah. into the ravine and we had to clear, clear out the car and I had to take everything on the bus. And the, the guy that met me at the bus station um, the next day looked at me and said, you're Tom Robinson, you're black. <laughs> and I went, ah, <laughs> I never knew that. Uh, it was, uh, and it was very strange. Uh, and as it turned out, Indianapolis happened to be one of the greatest places I ever worked and people oh, were so nice. Oh yeah, it was beautiful. But at that particular moment, you know, I was scared. scared so yeah. Mm -hmm. <laughs> yes, yeah, no. You were telling a story that I filled in for you so you could go on a, the blimp ride. Oh, and, yes. you had, and you had remembered that about me, but I don't, um, I don't know if you remember this, what you did for me that um, I was doing, I, I couldn't tell you what club, but it was a club in Fort Lauderdale and I was doing my very first appearance. I think I was doing a live broadcast. I don't think it was just Collins. By then you might have been at midday. I'm not really sure, but I, I don't know if you remember that about me, that I was very shy. I didn't, I wasn't shy on the radio, but right. I was petrified about going out and hosting this just petrified. Right. And, uh, I remember distinctly Peter was there and you showed up and I know a couple other jocks showed up, but I just remember both of you. And I think you did a break or two with me and you were, you were just like there for support mm -hmm. and kind of like showing me the ropes and kind of letting me know this is good. This is okay. <laughs> it's just a live <laughs> broadcast. Kimba don't fall over. And I always was very grateful that I had that kind of support now in radio, it just seems to be a lot of, it's more backstabby. That's such a word. Yeah, it is. It is. Well, the world is like that. So yeah, it, it just mimics the world. You know? So we've been, we reconnected on Facebook. I don't know how, however many years ago. So we've been in touch that way, but uh, to, in order to put this together, when I called you, you picked up the phone and we talked like it was uh, 30 years ago. Like we had just talked last week. And I, <laughs> well. and to me, that's, what I love so much about radio when back then mm. is that we had that kind of camaraderie that's, and you know, family. That's true. that's true. It was, it was a great time. It was a wonderful yeah. time. We had a, and we had a great staff, you know, uh, and uh, all of us, all of us really got along. As a matter of fact, uh, I was saying about Frank, uh, yes. was, and Frank, whatever his name is. Frank was. Felix. Frank, Frank Felix. <laughs> Wasn't he like now, manic, manic all the time? When he fired me, when he fired me, it was very, I've never had anything like this happen before. Uh, he said, you know, well, we found that, that the station, uh, the, the old classic rock format was most uh, people think of you when they think about the old format. We're going to be going in a different direction. So I'm going to have to let you go. And then he started to cry. Okay. And I'm going, you know, take it easy. It's all right. You know, I'm like, like, I'll bounce back. I'll bounce back. And it was really, it was really getting to him. And I was flipping out because, you know, uh, I mean, here I am being fired, but, you know, here I am consoling him because these are real tears coming from his eyes, you know. And uh, as a matter of a, 
this is this is the truth. I swear to God, this is the truth. When I left there and went to uh, uh, get unemployment, I didn't know the reason why I was fired. They said uh, they said you know reason what? for being uh, fired. You know? and I'm going, well, gosh, you know. So I had to call up Frank and say, you know, what what should I say? You know, why am, why am I being fired? You know. And he said, well, we're going in a new direction. That's the reason why you're going. Right. Oh, thank you. You know, one of those things. But that was that was I've never had that happen before. You know. When you did get fired by Frank Felix, which was somewhere in, in the area of 1991, once again, I was promoted. <laughs> <laughs> I didn't come back this time, though. No. You did not. <laughs> I did not come back. It's, it stuck this time, but I also um, took over because you were hosting the Rock and Roll Blues Hour. That's right. That's right. And I took over hosting it. It went on for like another year. But I had there's another story out of that. I went, um, so I belong to the South Florida Blues Society. Mm-hmm. And there was this band called Roach Thompson Blues Band, and they were they won the local competition, and then they were going to Memphis to for the National Amateur Blues Contest. One of the band members and his wife they did a thing for via the Blues Society where you could charter, get a place on a bus, right. and have a hotel room and kind of go and cheer them on. So I went. Oh, cool! Okay. It was awesome. They won the whole thing, so they they oh, won. Wow you know, the best blues band in, in, in America. And they got this B.B. Uh, King Lucille Award at the Handys in Memphis. At, but we're on the way back. And um, from Memphis to Miami, you go through Mississippi, Alabama, oh, yes. and the Panhandle. Yes, you do. Mm-hmm. And so we stopped at a diner. I don't remember where, but it was in somewhere in there. And we went and we sat down. And uh, most of the members of the uh, Roach Thompson Blues Band are black. And we were sitting in a booth with them, and we just weren't getting served. But I, in my ignorance, and, and just I start saying something about what's going on. It's not that busy here, not understanding what. And um, Freddie looked at me, and he said, we need to leave. Wow. And I said, why? I, I still wasn't. And then he, he's like, we, we need to go now. And then all of a sudden, it, it, I'm realizing what's going on. See, you see, that's stuff that always has to stay, stay in our heads, you know. Um, yeah, but um, I started getting loud. Willie just looked at me, and he just looked, it's not worth it, let's just go. Yeah, my, my move. And when I got, well, they were, they were kind of, probably like close to 20 years older than me. I asked, I was talking to them about it, and they said, it, it's just the way it is. And no, they absolutely made the smart decision because here I am. I'm writing checks with my mouth that they're going <laughs> to yeah. expect them to cash. And it, um, <laughs> and we well, didn't know, you know, we just stopped at this diner. Who knows who they could have called in and it could have ended very badly. So they definitely made the right call. But I remember it. So I don't Willie's no longer with us. I don't even know if Freddie would remember that story or not. I'm really not sure. I remember it. Because I remember their faces. I remember how horrific it was. Yeah. But I also remember that's the only time that ever happened to me. See, For the two of them. See, guilt by association. You know, mm-hmm. <laughs> uh, they had, uh, you know, I've been fired a lot in this business. Um, you know, that's just comes with the, comes with the territory. Mm-hmm. And um, doing the Rock and Roll Blues Hour, I really loved doing it in Zeta. When I went to Boston, I did the Rock and Roll Blues Hour in Boston. And I had a boss, now check this out. When they canceled the show and they canceled the Rock and Roll Blues Hour, my boss said to me, yeah, we're gonna we're gonna have to stop, we're gonna stop that show. I mean, what does the blues have to do with rock and roll anyway? Are you kidding me? I swear to God, I swear <laughs> to God. And he went, oh. yeah, never mind. It's never not, mind. It's not worth it. And he's the same guy, he's the same guy that when he fired me, I'm in his office and he's saying, you know, Tom, we're gonna have to let you go. And I'm noticing the head of security is on the couch behind me. And I'm going, well, okay, okay, you're firing me. But what, what's Paul, Paul doing here in the room while you're firing me? Then all of a sudden it hits me. He's here to make sure I don't kick the crap out of you. I'm going, oh, okay. I said, you know, that's the smartest move you ever made. I was gonna say, good move, dude. Good move. Seriously, yeah, it's a true story. (laughs) So to that end, to your true story, and I kind of alluded to the blimp story, and and we talked about arrests and all that stuff, you have a book in the works. 
Yes, I do. It's uh, yeah, the, the working title is No Static at All. From I the, love it. FM? Yes, from the Staley Dan song. And it'll just be filled chock full of stories, just, <laughs> just like the ones we're talking about now. Yeah. Uh, oh, yeah. It was on the air for, what, 23 hours? It was a Rolling Stones thing, and you were on the air for... 20 because I remember we all went in for our regular shifts, but we just kind of were your assist. Yeah, I, I tried to hang out for 24 hours, but after 14 hours, my voice went. Uh, <laughs> after, about, after about 20 hours, I'm bouncing off the walls. <laughs> really? Uh, yeah, I was on the air for 23 hours straight, and um, that was that. <laughs> That was pretty interesting. I do remember that because I think I was there when you were losing your voice. Yeah. By the, by the time I came in, you were you were uh, getting toasty. And I played every single Rolling Stone song known to mankind, um, <laughs> which, which is funny. Uh, just just a quickie, just a quickie. Oh please! I used to do my show live from Woody's on the Beach. You remember Ron Wood? Oh sure, yeah. The Rolling Stones. He had a he had a, a nightclub mm -hmm. in Miami Beach. And I used to uh, do an hour of my show, put it on tape, and a limousine would be outside in front of the station, and the limo would drive me, drive me down to Miami Beach, and then I'd get out and I'd do my show uh, <laughs> uh, live from from where he's on the beach. And I'll never forget the time uh, Ron Wood, I'm I'm I've got a, a a fever, I'm burning up, I've got like about 103 temperature, you know. And um, I'm doing my show, and Ron's going, oh, Dom, good to see you, good to see you. And he's, and he's coming over, and I'm going, you know, I, I'm, I'm getting a fever. Oh, that's okay, that's okay. And the next week, it was like, Ron's sick. <laughs> Ron, I can't see you. But, uh, that, that was lots of fun. That was, that was also the same place where uh, Mick Taylor of the Rolling Stones, who, who took the place of, uh, uh, well, he played guitar for the Rolling Stones right after Brian Jones died. And uh, I'm interviewing, I'm interviewing Mick. So you've got me with a microphone, you've got Mick, and then you've got Mick's manager right behind Mick, you know? So I said, yeah, Mick, you know, I mean, playing with the Rolling Stones, what a great gig, you know? Why did you ever leave that? And as soon as I say that, the manager behind Mick is going, <laughs> <laughs> It's <laughs> yeah, on the on leaving job. <laughs> <laughs> and so I answered it for him. You know, I said, probably wanted to go do your own thing, right? Yeah, okay. Well, you know, and, but that was lots I, of fun. Too. I love when you ask those questions that they get really you don't know it's gonna be that kind of a trigger question, yet it is. It's like, whoops, <laughs> sorry. Oh yeah, uh, Robert Palmer was in a band called Vinegar Joe. And I said, oh, yeah, I wanted to talk a little bit about vinegar gel. And all of a sudden, his whole face changed. I mean, he's like, you know, like with a smile. And all of a sudden, I mentioned the word vinegar gel. And, and it was like, you know, uh, you know, and I said, oh, uh, maybe not. Maybe not. Maybe we won't talk about that. Yeah. Uh, well, you also used to do, because I know I, I sent you some of those phone calls. They were staticky. So I don't know that I could air them here because the sound quality is pretty bad. But I, I think I sent them to you via messenger when you were doing call-ins from Haggerty's. Because you used to do stand up there. Oh, yes, stand up comedy. Yes, yes. Uh, I just got, I just got uh, on Facebook. A couple of my friends who went to those shows uh, reminded me, reminded my, uh, remind me of my stand up. And some of the jokes, some of the jokes that I wrote. See, I never write anything down. That's one probably one of my biggest problems. And even <laughs> this book, this book should have been finished about two years ago. You know, what I'm saying? You know I write a chapter maybe once every three months, but. Um, yeah, uh, and someone wrote, uh, by the time I opened up for Tommy Chong, uh, Cheech and Chong, and, uh, and then mentioned a joke that I used to do that I had forgotten all about, you know, and she goes, oh, I still tell it today, you know, I still tell it today, I'm like, wow, yeah, that's right, I did, I did write that joke, yeah. And, I just uh, had somebody uh, message today on Facebook about a break that they heard me do once upon a time about a song, and to this day, I mean, and, and wrote out what I used to say. See, you see, uh, people, people remember this stuff. You I know? think that's awesome. I thought that was so cool because it's like, wow, <laughs> okay. <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. As a matter of fact, just yesterday, uh, a, a lady that uh, that said, uh, she said that I met her, and she looked familiar anyway. She, she said we met once, and she said that I was revered, revered in Indianapolis, you know? There you go. I mean, well, I'm going, well, I was well, I got back, you know, taste maybe, but you know, I said, you're very, that's, that's really nice of you to say, but that can make you, your whole day, you know, 
especially you know when I you know I'm not doing much now. We're just hanging out and making sure that I'm not dead yet. Yeah, <laughs> and you're getting your book done. So is there a timeline for when it's going to be out, or you just um, whenever? Uh, soon. I have a I have a company that uh, wants to publish it. And they keep on calling me. They call me up every month. So that, that that always fires me to write a little bit more every month. You know, I'm going, yeah, 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 it's coming. It's coming. It's coming. I totally have plans to write a book about radio. But if I do, I really have to make sure I'm done. Yeah, yeah, <laughs> <laughs> exactly. Because oh, I will yeah, be. Yeah. You see, I'm done. I, you, know, uh, you know how they say, <laughs> don't burn your bridge. You know, I blow mine up. Yeah. Right. Oh, yeah. <laughs> I'm but, thinking uh, certain chapters will be flammable. So <laughs> yeah, <laughs> that happens. And, you know, I've been doing it since you know the 70s. I was from the 70s to the 90s uh, and the late 90s because my last job was um, my last job was in um, I think it was in Miami. It was in Miami. WBGG. Oh, big, still? yeah. Mm-hmm. Yeah, it's still around. Doing, yeah. Yeah, I was doing BGG and. Uh, I think that was my last job, my last radio job. And then I was doing like commercials, you know, and doing, uh, but I was never much of a, of a commercial person anyway, you know? Yeah. You do great commercials, you know? I always loved good commercials. I mean, I could never, yeah, I was just terrible with that, you know? I was, I was really, and the last, uh, one of the last jobs I had, when we did commercials, I would just voice them. There was a guy, there was a guy to put all that stuff Good. together, he had a production guy. And so I had to sit there and, and just do the copy. And then, you know, two days later, I, I did this beautiful commercial. But I was never really that good at that, you know? Yeah, there's, I just love the creativity of it. And they would let me, again, that was something else back then. You, they, you'd come up with concepts for commercials, you know, at the clubs and stuff, and they'd just let you run with it. That's, so. true. That's true. Oh, yeah, I did have a, uh, I used to do Haggerty's Comedy Club. Those used to be all, I wrote all those commercials. Mm-hmm. And they, they, were, they were a joy. They were fun to do. They were fun to do. And that's what made them all stand out because they were all very unique and different because we were just letting our freak flags fly. Yeah, weird. <laughs> <laughs> we love weird. We're just juggies. We love weird. You know? While the uh, world is seemingly, hopefully, taking a turn for the better, mm. radio, not so much. No. no. <laughs> but well, at least. Know. You and I got to be there when it. In the days, you know, be able to tell you, yeah, I remember. <laughs> I, I, remember I know that's yeah. what it sounds like. Back in the day, <laughs> radio was fantastic. <laughs> well, we used to just listen to rocks, you know, you just pick up a rock. And just go, oh. If you if you would like to share your your signature sign off for, for those people who will go, Tom Robinson, I know him. He used to always end his show with. Stick a fork in me. I'm done. <laughs> yeah. Your your newsletter even ends with that, by the way. Does it really? Stick a fork in me. I'm done. It was a complete joy to talk to you. It's been a B-A-L-L. You know what I'm talking about? It really has been. Maybe not as exciting as Juicy Brucey, but Tom Van Dam, Tom Robinson, Thomas the Semper. The T. The T. He is. All of the up. I can't wait to read the book, so I hope it co- I hope it's soon. Well, you're you're going to get an autographed copy, that's for sure. And thank you for sharing part two of your story here. No problem. My, my pleasure. Thank you for letting me, allowing me. Tom Robinson, what a pleasure. Thank you so much for agreeing to do this and chat with me. I'm so glad we were able to make it happen, catch up and reconnect with you. Thank you for listening to Me Kimbo Radio Broadcast, episode 11. Now the wind has changed direction. This on the radio. Woo! <laughs>